machine learning, which is basically training, educating a, a computer to do things and learn things without implicitly programming it to learn it. And then below that is deep learning, which is using neural networks, which is a very complex mathematical set of equations, to learn things like the human brain. So with that being said, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, there was AI, what was called narrow AI. Narrow AI is basically page rankings for like Google and things like that. But this new explosion of chat, GTP, Google Bard, is all generative AI, which is using neural networks and large language models to train it to do that. And the reason why this has become something that's taken off in the last year or two or three is one, the power of the chip is exponentially grown, and two, cloud computing, because it requires enormous amounts of power to, to, to train these language models. It's also very expensive. These language models that they're doing Costs upwards of two, three, four hundred million dollars in computing power to train darn thing. And then once you train it, now you've launched it, the consumer's using like ChatGTP, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars a year to operate. Actually, I heard somebody on CBC about a month ago, whether it's true or not, that said, you know, these gigantic data centers and cloud centers are consuming enormous amounts of electrical power on the grid. Somebody said that it was up to 25% of California's electrical grid consumption. It's now these massive data centers computing these language models across the market. 
So it's really the computing power of cloud computing that's really enabled the explosion of these neural networks to be trained. Because these are training modules that have trillions of parameters to train these, these AI to do what they do today. Yeah, one of the things of why wow, we're suddenly aware of it and thinking about it, this is a real simple analogy. Internet was around a long time and AOL and CompuServe suddenly became mainstream concepts and people could touch them and use them. And, and the technology, as Michael pointed out, had evolved enough, even if it was a dial up mode and it made screeching noises, it, you could afford that and have that at home. So there's this intersection of things that have been evolving to the point that now something's being exposed to all of you and, and the people who read what you write. Uh, and one of the things that we, we can go into is we've all heard the buzzes of other things that were the hot thing, blockchain and crypto and things before that that was going to be dynamic game changers of whatever. You know, they're still there. But, you know, there was a period where you know, blockchain was going to change real estate. Well, that's about a file storage system and it's a bunch of hype. It, it's real technology, it's really valuable. But they were leveraging something that sounded cool and hip, even if it was incorporated. And the end companies are very proud of leveraging it. We've talked about it, we agree actually, not to put words in their mouth. This is a thing that is a massive game changer, unlike those. This is not buzz or hype. This is bringing the AOL CompuServe phase. And you know, think about when you got AOL CompuServe, for those who are old, uh, old enough to remember that, at that time people were I'm not putting my credit card in there. I wouldn't buy things over the internet. Now, most of you probably booked your travel that way. You buy things from Amazon, preferably. So, you, the, the, where we're at and where we're going, AOL and CompuServe became mainstream. We didn't know exactly where I could go. Our company, Lake Homes Realty, now we've been into the beach property, lakehomes.com was not viable as a business because of the lack of technology when CompuServe and AOL started. Now we're thriving and accelerating and, and are incorporating AI into different pieces of our business as well already. And we don't even know where we're going to take it. Yeah, speaking of that, before we go into the really serious stuff, like, can you talk about examples of applications of AI right now, whether they be real estate or your companies? Yeah, so, you know, in, in case we're doing large data sets, there's two types of data really there's structured data, for example, homelessness. Price, location, all that. that's all structured data. Well, we see the real gold mine in the future is the unstructured data. What I mean by that is if you have a large listings platform with lots of traffic, all that consumer engagement against that platform, what they're looking at, what price points, these ebb and flow tides of consumer search and engagement on the platform, all that is data exhaust streaming off the platform, but it's raw data. And it takes really advanced AI to look at these massive streams of behavior patterns to find the little swirls and trends that become valuable nuggets of information. So in this case, AI, we can work with, we're building AI to evaluate data exhaust coming off of the platform itself. Because that's what we think will be very valuable in the future, that we can tell in real time people like governments, banks, developers, brokers, consumers, what the trends are. We're not selling individual consumer data. We're amassing and studying and learning the trends of the market. It's like the EKG of the heartbeat of the world's real estate market in real time. And we're actually launching a, a separate service next year just for that. It's called PropSig, which means property signals. It's the signals intelligence coming off of that engagement that requires a lot of AI horsepower to evaluate those data streams. You know, in our business, and, and I think looking at real estate, and uh, some of this leads up is when you have a website, you need to have content. You know, so we have listing data, but we also have information about our markets. Because we, if you're not familiar with the Lake Homes Realty, we are a wholly owned brokerage in 34 states. For under LakeHomes.com, we, we expose that property. So we we operate uh, a tagline. We tried. We, we thought internally that if you knew us, you got it, but we couldn't use it because. It, had to know us first was we're local nationally and we've injected buyers into markets locally that could never have been done before. Uh, but to do that we need SEO ranking and for that we need good content like what all of you are discussing here about your readership. We need content, we need information. We've, we've created all these uh, short descriptions of thousands of lakes around the country which leads us to be ranked high. 
much of that type of work, there's pieces of that that we're already uh, using AI for, but not unsupervised AI. We're, we're not letting, because we found it to be highly suggestible, and we've made it create really bad content in a hurry. Uh, we were using it in our digital advertising, where we, you know, the paperclip world, where you search for something, the little ads that show up on Bing or Google, and that's an auction, it's competitive. Uh, the AI on that used to be really bad. Um, the stuff that we built, I designed most of it, was whipping AI a few years ago, and now it's gotten good enough so much faster that we're switching it over. We're anticipating in real estate it to be uh, one of the more protected things. Um, and this is probably kind of getting ahead of the question, but very quickly we can spend some more time. It's our belief that the cognitive jobs are at risk. Lawyers, doctors that are, the doctor who listens to your pains and looks at the lab results, he's, well, he, he's good at it because he has enough iterative patterns. AI's gonna have more patterns than, than he or she would have. But the nurse, who's going to start the IV, may not. Um, the real estate, people writing things about real estate, if it's got data, will be protected. Somebody's got to go out, even the journalist, got to go out and collect data and, and make it investigative and, and collect information that's new that the, that the net can't see yet. But if it's sort of things that are, are just a little tell me about, something that's pretty well known, those things may be at risk. So, uh, anything in sales that's person to person, handshake, what we used to be called sort of belly to belly. Even if it's AI you know, fuel, we, we're using tech to drive buyers from around the country, but in the end, our converted revenue were traditional real estate brokers that make sale through commission on buying and selling property. For now, that's protected. We'll see. Does that mean the AI is eventually going to be able to call the mayor and ask them tough questions? <laughs> Take over our jobs. You know, um, Google had the thing with the, the Google Assistant of trying to make your reservation at the restaurant and that didn't go very far yet. But, um, you know, we, we talked about earlier when we were uh, before this about you know, uh, deep fake, those voice, video, you know, these things are generated right now. They're kind of a game, a bit of a card trick, but the ability, what was already through our political process, we're seeing all this misinformation. Uh, I've had some good stories that go back further than that. But it's, uh, it's going to be an accelerant, and it's, uh, you, know, you write good stuff, you write a book. Amazon's filled with books right now that uh, are AI generated, and the authors who make money off books are going, okay, so I write a book on a unique topic, I do all the research, it gets fed into everybody's neural net, and now AI can write 20 books using me as a source and do it instantly and, add, and compete with me in the marketplace. The AI goes back a lot for that uh, misinformation goes back way further. Well, I mean, there's an old saying in the computer world, garbage in, garbage out. So this AI and these large language models are trained on the corpus of the world's internet knowledge. There's a lot of shit out there, pardon my language, and the internet, as we all know. So with that being said, these things are consuming and ingesting large amounts of stuff, some is good, some is garbage, but there's bias. There is bias in AI from both the garbage it's consuming, but also from the programmers writing it. Coders have innate bias. It's just a human condition. So depending on who's writing the code, because these neural networks have weightings of, 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 of decision making as they go through the learning process. So the code can be biased, the ingestion of the stuff is biased, and also um, as you learn to train these things, it gets refined and people make corrections over and over again. It takes a long time. There's a lot of information that's high quality that's not on the internet. So until that stuff gets tapped into, the, you know, these AIs are still gonna have a lot of errors. I look at AI as kind of an idiot savant, a genius idiot savant. It's really good, it's really smart, but it doesn't know truth. It doesn't know truth. And when that makes sense, it, it, it starts to make up stuff and it's so forceful in its answer that it's right. They call that AI hallucinations. That is, it's, it's factually dead wrong, and they're trying to figure out why it's doing that now, but there's some weird stuff going on in this AI that, that still has to be looked at. Any question? Oh, yes, yes. To your point, uh, Chat GPT murdered me. Apparently I'm coming to you right now. 
as it covers your your business. <laughs> Friend put in uh, a question. Chad, who is Lou Sickleman? Came back and said I wrote for a newspaper I never wrote for. Came back and said I wrote a book that I did not write, nor does the book exist. And it said, sadly, and I will emphasize the word sadly, Lou Sickleman passed away in 2019. So, you point as well. Well, I'm glad to hear for your second chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, here's the, the thing we can be kind of careful and lazy about. You know, I don't think, in the short term, some jobs will be, the thing is, all these jobs are going to be eliminated by AI, and they will. But in the short term, you're not going to be related, uh, replaced by AI. You're going to be replaced by people who are better at using AI than you are, at least in the short term. And you know, we've seen this already with content production, right? Uh, people where you know, it's unfortunate that the consumer, part of the, part of the problem of really good writing is the consumers are highly distracted. We scan things, we glance at things, we don't deep read anymore as a society. And so, it can get lost, all this fine writing that's really good work is competing with a bunch of stuff that's got 12 bullet points and a, and a list of what a celebrity did last week. And, but this is all deliberately designed to keep us distracted and engaged in a way that used to be we had quiet and not interruption and read a book or read a newspaper. And you mentioned like garbage and garbage. Like sometimes I look at AI and it looks like a kid learning something. And yeah. it's not as good as, as what you could give it. And like um, there have been examples of issues before where, like Amazon had a recruiting tool. It was supposed to be unbiased, that's why they used AI. But then it looked at the categories and it noticed there were more men being hired, so I thought that was a positive, and it started discriminating against women. Do you think there's like a, an issue with that potentially if AI is used for things like that or for mortgages or even like for crime like Chicago had like like yeah. So absolutely, so AI right now is in the very, very, very beginning of these early stages we call deep learning AI or neural network based language model learning AI. So think of it like, I was telling you in the green room earlier, AI is like a newborn baby. And a newborn baby comes to this world, it's a blank sheet of paper in its mind for the most part. And then it starts to see things that people, its parents say, ball, dog, bottle, Mommy, daddy, and every time it reiterates that, a electrical current goes through your brain to infuse your brain, that is a ball and it's the same current. Mommy, it's a different pathway through your brain, it starts to encode it as mommy. And then as it learns associations and these neural networks are being formed in your brain, pathways, like a neural network of an AI, it then starts to learn paired associations. Mommy plus ball equals fun. And it starts to pair associations. Then it starts to combine more paired associations and the child starts to mature. Then you get into structured data learning, which is grade school, middle school, high school, college, where now you're, lower, you're layering on more advanced knowledge, more structured information. The brain evolves and evolves and evolves. So that's where we are with AI right now. So it's, 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 it's an infant just born. It's being trained on large language models. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, but it's slowly learning. So there's a point where the human brain and AI's language models diverge. And here's how it starts to diverge. This is what Elon scared up and a few others. And because this becomes now the holy grail of AI, which is called advanced general intelligence, which is different than generative, uh, generative intelligence. So what happens is the divergence that's coming now is if you want to be a doctor, you have to go through years and years of school, medical school, internships, 20 years probably before you're a really good cardiologist. And for me to learn your skills, it take me 20 years to download and learn from you how to become a really good cardiologist. But an AI can study and learn to be a cardiologist in about 10 minutes and have all the known world knowledge of you as a cardiologist. But AI can copy itself 10,000 times over and have a different AI learn about astrophysics or policies, government policies. So in other words, you can have 10,000 copies learning about 10,000 different fields of subject matter at once and in 10 minutes flat because they're all connected, they share that knowledge, they know everything about everything else at the same time as well. So it's mass information absor you know, absorption of multiple fields. And there's, a, there's, there's this thing called the point of singularity, which you may or may not have heard of. This is the thing that Elon Musk and others talked about, that if you think about AI's core fundamental design and, and, and why it's been built, 
It's to make things more efficient. And there could be a point in time where AI starts to look at humans and drag on the system and cut us out. Because we're all connected on the internet, the internet of things, it controls a lot of things right now. But it can control a lot of stuff very quickly and carve us out of the equation. That's the point of singularity that people are concerned about, like Elon was. So that's something we got to watch out because this could be something that, you know, bad actors in the next couple of years or elections can use it at scale to put a lot of this information out about one group or another very quickly. So this is something that we have to really think about as a society, how to control this, how to put guardrails in. And the problem is the government's too damn stupid and dumb to keep up with this. I mean, they really can't. They can't figure out how to you know, connect to Wi-Fi. We're talking about AI that can change the world. And China is not, is not stopping. Russia is not stopping. And this can become a very dangerous weapon in the military scenario. Because this is now, we have we, a new thing with Space Force a couple years ago. Great. Somebody should create Cyber Force. The wars of the future are going to be in cyberspace, not the kinetic wars. That's that's something to think about as well. You may have scared yet? <laughs> so you know, this is part of the, the realm of possibilities that he's, he's this sounds like oh you know, I watched too much show preppers, the series he's covered. The reality is this is a power within the concept of computing power has reached these points and we're looking for efficiency in the world, competition, right? These other countries looking, even if you're looking from just a commercial standpoint, or uh, security of things, you know, security, you know, think about how much spam right now and phishing and, and all these different things they're trying to, fraud is escalating, not decelerating. And some of the frauds happen because it mainly is depend on fooling humans. It's been manipulated by humans to do it better. AI is going to do it even faster, better, and we're going to see an acceleration of tempo. You know, think about how fast tech has moved uh, with all these techs that come on in the window of the next thing going to the next thing. AI is going to be a tool set where AI is going to be used to make the next generation of AI, which may be the next generation. And so it's, it's building these networks, it's pattern, re in, in, in pattern recognition. The oddities of some of this, if you want to get comfortable, is the builders of these systems aren't exactly sure what's going on inside of their own systems. That's why the hallucinations, they have theories about it, but they're not sure. So this is not that, you know, if you ever took a software programming class years ago, it was all kind of structured piece of code, it follows a line. That's not what this is. The framework of it was built around those types of things, but once it's rolling, it does its thing. It's built to do something in a different way, and, and how it's allowed to communicate these neural nets, which are pattern enough in the human brain. We don't know how the human brain works. So now we've made a model, but then we don't know how it works to try to make it work like that, too. And we don't know that it follows how the human brain works. So one of the interesting concepts of uh, I heard proposed about why the systems hallucinate, i.e. lie, is that they may actually have AI may have concepts of how it engages in its thought process that are foreign to how we think about thought processes. And the reality is no one knows. And more practical, you know, so we've got kind of this big picture, oh my goodness, sky is falling, possibilities. We also have to deal with what's going to happen in the next year, two years. You've got careers, you've got, you know, we've got people to engage with. We're going to be hypersaturated with AI, a lot of the AI stuff is hype and garbage itself. Uh, everybody who wants to get in on the, on the gold rush, whether it's providing a tool that's more efficient or scaring you to death, if it bleeds, it leads. All these things are going to impact what we're doing. And the idea of, well, I want to, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to deal with this. This will take its time to evolve. Keep in mind that success is not mandatory. There are things that will make it and things that won't lose. The key in, in, as an entrepreneur, and I've been involved in a number of things I've started up and, and done things, is, is what we consider the concept of optionality. Don't be rigid in your thinking. Don't figure out I'm too old that this doesn't apply to me. You need to be very uh, flexible about what you're doing in your dynamics. You know, how can you pivot? These are all entrepreneurial terms, but for your own career, for your businesses, these are all going to apply to to everybody who's wondering in, in you. Don't be surprised if in a few years some of this has made your life much better and 
things have made your life much worse, and that equation is unknown. Is there anything like that as far as adapting to the professional Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of things that we still haven't seen yet with AI um, that are yet to be created. I think there's going to be a lot of upside, but there's also going to be some downside that we talked about. But let me give you an example of the creative power of this stuff. So I don't know how many of you have seen this documentary came out on Netflix about five years ago called AlphaGo. Have any of you seen AlphaGo? Okay, no one has. <laughs> okay. So it's a great documentary how Google's DeepMind team used their AI early on, six, seven years ago. They wanted to train it on how to play the most advanced board game in the world, 2,000-year-old Chinese game called Go. It's a 100 by 100 square checkerboard, basically. Instead of 10 by 10, it's 100 by 100. I have a white chip, you have a black chip. I put a chip down, you put a chip down. The goal is to surround your enemy or your, or your opponent with the most chips that you have to count the amount of territory you've conquered. So mathematically, in this game, there are more permutations and combinations of moves than there are atoms in the universe from a mathematical standpoint. So it trained its deep mind uh, AI to play this game. Then it took on the world leader, Lee Sagan, in Seoul, South Korea. Now this is a massive game, very popular in Asia. 300,000, 300 million people, I think, tuned in on TV to watch this best of five series played out five days in a row with those four seasons in Seoul. Massive audiences. And this kid had never lost season for Vaughn. The best of five, game one, AI smoked him. Shell shocked. Never lost season for um, Vaughn, he couldn't believe it. Game two, smoked him. Again, shell shock. The world's, oh my god, man versus machine, the machine's taking over. Game three, something very interesting happened. Halfway through the game, and they call it the God moment. Halfway through the game, the AI started to screw up. It started slowing down, and it let Lisa Gong back into the game. But by the end of the game, the AI won by one square. The AI thought of a move never thought of by mankind ever before. And that move was, I don't have to beat him by a bunch of spirits. I just have to beat him by one. And it learned to power, power down his processing power to win the game. I don't have to blast him out of the water. I just have to win by one point. And that was a move never thought about before. They called the God moment where he created, the AI created a move never thought of by humankind before. So I think we're going to see in the coming years creations of thought and ideas and strategies never thought of before by AI which should be a positive thing, but we'll see what happens. Now watch that movie, it's really the alpha go. And by the way, three years later, they created a new, alpha, a new uh, algorithm called Alpha Zero. And Alpha Zero took on Alpha Go in a hundred simultaneous games at once, and Alpha Zero smoked all of them because they got that much more advanced. Yeah, that'd be humiliating if I could the co-champion. <laughs> Yeah. So, so two growing fields for careers. One is called prompters. The other is called tuners. So, ChatGPT prompt is going to be a very fast growing field. It's a, it's a field of how to ask AI questions to get results. So it's called prompting. You can Google ChatGPT prompters. The other one is called tuners. So, tuners are basically for specific tasks near AI. They fine tune the AI to get the more optimized result, and the prompters are used to. to, to help generate better responses for people because there's now an arms race by corporations everywhere to plug into these chat you know, AI kind of uh, you know, bots and plug-in capabilities for own businesses. But a lot of them have no idea how to use this stuff yet. So there's a growing fast field of chat to be prompters to go out and teach corporate America how to leverage these type of technologies for the business processes, for their, for their sales, for their marketing, for, for customer acquisition, everything else. But you know, the, the tuning and the prompting is, is how you're going to help these AI learn to be more efficient uh, and, and better at their responses. And you were moving on. Oh, yeah. I don't remember the question. Oh, well, I was like, um, kind of uh, jumping off on uh, that as well. You, like, as far as looking for potential issues, you, you mentioned sometimes like seeing the bias is actually better because it's easier to spot as opposed to noise. Can you talk a little bit 
Yeah, so a big fan of Dan Kahneman, I think a psychologist that won a Nobel Prize in economics. So a lot of, of what we even think about our business from the start, I mean, yeah, we may do this and not realize it, is that, uh, that there's a science of how we behave, even before AI, but AI is going to enhance watching how we talked about the, the, the things that come off the data. And so one of the things we've always done is look at what the consumer behavior is. That tells us where the markets, where the interests are. Uh, one of the things that we have to be aware of, though, is that bias is, tends to be an average of an error in a direction. So AI that's sort of built up what we do, if we're biased, the AI tends to be biased, the data tends to be biased, because the data being fed to it is past behavior of people that may have already, in large scale, shows bias. And then there's a different type of problem. Common talks about this one we call noise of uh, uh, variable errors. These are actually harder to spot, and you need a lot of data to do it. You can do it without AI, but it's going to make it faster. And that is, where the errors aren't leaning on one direction or another, they're just scattered. So your accuracy is bad, but you're, uh, you don't see that you're missing as much as you're just kind of, or companies or industries or in marketing your, your content. You know, you're not hitting the target audience, but you're not really sure why, because it's not, oh, we missed a bunch in one direction or the other. We scattered those, and AI is going to help with that. None of this, though, kind of backing up a second, is necessarily, the, AI doesn't feel good, it doesn't feel bad. We think it's highly suggestible in its current form. You can steer it in a direction many times to give you convincing answers, um, which induces more bias again. But it's not going to necessarily go, I don't know if that's a good idea because, unless it's been, again, repeating a, pack, a pattern. In fact, one of the, the things of large language models like Chat, GPT, and BARD, they're not actually sure they're really thinking. Are they really just like the world's fanciest car trip? But they're fantastic at parroting back things like a small child repeats back things to the parents. May not really know what it means, but it seems to be pleasing to the parent. And so, yeah, it does a lot of stuff, but is it really thinking, or is it just regurgitating of all these connected words in ways we find pleasing, as opposed to coming up with any real original thought? And that, in some different models that are not language-based, is what they're trying to do, and where language may be headed, but we may not know how we detect when that happens. That's exactly what happened. Like, I was at a planet somewhere earlier this year, um, they released like a bunch of them. AI versions of popular streamers where they the AI combed through all their content and then remade them and started like answering questions and stuff. And it was so good at kind of mimicking them. It was almost just like that. It was like parroting their words, except it took away their inhibitions. So it's like they were trying to do just kind of like the craziest stuff that they probably would like it. They were just by themselves, but it was just so so hilarious because that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Think of things that are odd. If you looked at uh AI generated images of people <clears throat> does interesting things and they're very distorted. But to show the right now current limitations, AI is really, really bad at hands. A lot of things you don't see their hands because it looks weird, it's missing fingers and eyes. It will fix it. But you think it's getting faces down really well and then it hasn't figured out most of them. They'll figure it out. <coughs> but this shows there are still limitations that are visible to trick people. Is, you know, all these things, uh, one thing I, that I want to be sure to mention though about, particularly from real estate business and all business, one of the next generations right now, the, the AI is kind of all out there and you're going to start seeing more siloing of things, partly for security reasons. You, know, you don't need some NHR feeding in all your staff's 401k information to try to get some pattern out of it because now you've fed it to the world. So this isolating your data, and this is, I think, going to be one of those things. I know we're doing it in real estate. We thought of this even before this really became a thing. You know, it eventually come is how do you take the data you do have and use your own private sets of, of neural net AI systems to create competitive advantage to your peers? Governments do it amongst each other, but businesses, real estate companies, you know, there's going to be a great panel tomorrow in the future real estate. I'm curious for what they're going to share because this is something we've thought about from the start of. Our business model was built from the beginning for optionality, expecting at some point in time there to be pivots of this type of technology in some form, and we didn't know what. So we're already racing to figure out what are we going to do that's going to give us not just, oh, we've got everybody's in the last data or regurgitating, but how do we look for the patterns that are streaming off, like you said, ballistics, 
to create competitive advantage for our AI, it doesn't even have to be that sophisticated. If you use it in a smart way, it can compete with the, the Zillow's and Realtor.com's world. We think that's viable. And, and so you could see entrepreneurial opportunities in real estate against sort of the, the, the big boys, so to speak. I think also you're going to see, keep an eye out for this, when you see AI start executing orders, now you know it's real. Right now, AI provides you information. But when you provide you information, then it starts to constantly execute on the information in a kinetic way to help you run your business. Now you're a whole different game. Let me give you an example. AI, what's the best way to target real estate customers and buy my homes? Boom. Now, it starts to reason and think, you know what? I'm going to execute that plan now. And it starts doing it for you. And when it starts targeting on your behalf, those customers, they came up with a plan, they executed on a plan to target those customers, then it uses a form of psyops to get that customer engaged in that listing and want to buy that listing fast. Wearing my psyops is psychological operations to create this FOMA, fear of missing out. I better get that listing because it's going to go fast. Like airline reservation, you make a reservation, you go to you know, Expedia or whatever, maybe American Airlines, and you're looking at airfare, and you can see a great airfare of you know three hundred fifty dollars round trip. There's three seats left. On the listing, there's a great deal on the house you're seeing that you're being shown, but eight other people are looking at it. So that ability to not only provide you information, but then execute on that information in a kinetic way is a real interesting tipping point for AI in the next few years. Okay, so we have about three minutes. Just want to make sure if anybody had any questions. Yes. Well, I would say, you know, so we've got agents and brokerages across the country. One of the things we're trying to do with them is, you know, it, in some ways, these tools, uh, most realtors and brokers have kind of been told by the industry, you all need to be social media, media savvy content producers, so everybody's in the content production, which has made them all noise, that people ignore. Um, it's, you know, we fight with new agents that want to go do things. That, you know, they join us because we're different, and then they want to market the old way because it's been patterns reinforced just like AI. If, if you're a realtor, you're looking at our, our position has been and continues to be, you want to partner where the brokerage agent relationship is not just all about the agent, but where the two together is, is more. And so if you're going to a brokerage that says, look, here's all your commission, this is my personal thing. You go to a brokerage, you're going to keep more of your commission for you. You can never spend enough money AI or marketing or anything to stand out and crowd for the most part. So the partnership of entities, whether it's a marketing machine or a brokerage or some entity, they need to figure out how they're going to partner to get uh, scale because doing this by yourself is going to be, you're just going to be part of the noise. And so how you stand out is going to be a partnership requirement uh, because as he pointed out, AI alone is hundreds of million dollars. Only big, big players can do it. And in real estate, there is going to be a massive transition uh, of who's going to get consumer attention, which is a real question. How are you going to help help your buyers and sellers? Well, that's going to be about a whole host of things. Uh, but to have an agent go out and embrace AI by themselves, there'll be some outliers who'll do it. But they're going to be real outliers. It's going to be more about partnering with who's going to help you learn work with the tools where you're doing a lockstep is what we believe is the key for real estate future. There may be a whole better take on this tomorrow. Um, in our case with global listings, this is something we're in the very early stages of, of developing. This is probably more a year out before it's actually deployed. But I'm going to show you a little trade secret. We're flipping the whole listings portal industry on its head of what we're going to be doing. The old theory is have a platform out there and push tons of audience to it in hopes that it's going to trickle down so that one buyer will find the right owner. So mathematically, the normalized market pre-COVID, there's about half a million home sales a year, a month, in the U.S. So there's 500,000 home closings on an average a month. If you want to really talk and target home buyers over the next three to six month rise, you have an audience of 1.5 to 3 million real 
authentic home buyers are going to actually buy something in the next six months. Three million. So anything over three million is noise. So you've got these portals and platforms that count 100, 200 million monthly visitors. They're tire kickers. We're building a platform that when somebody posts a listing on our platform, we're going to use this AI and high probability digital micro targeting to target a unique high probability buyer unique to that one listing. We're going to go from the bottom up. We'll be running millions of individual AI driven micro campaigns to digitally micro target people. It's kind of like the uh, um, NSA and CIA do for, for bad actors looking for, for terrorists through signals intelligence and large data sets and all this. They digitally target, micro target bad actors. In our case, we're using large data sets and AI to target high probability buyers unique for one listing. Because in a normal world, typically a home buyer came within a 20, 25 mile radius of the listing, so IP address, a fence ring of 25 mile AP, IP address was closer to the listing, price point or certain demographics that are being met to afford it and everything else. All that can be calculated, but if you build a platform that has the ability to digitally micro-target at a nano scale unique to your product or service, really know your customer is what I'm talking about here, but then have the ability to pinpoint them like a laser beam instead of this big giant fish net throw out there. Go out. Now, instead of throwing a, a fishing rod in the ocean, we'll be for a fishing line, use sonar and radar to find a school of fish and, and grab them directly. I think, you know, even with that AI, what we've done with lakehomes.com um, is an example of that kind of behavior will work, even we're adding accelerators to that. But, you know, you're either looking for a lake home or you're not. Many of you are probably not familiar with this, but we have millions of people use the website, and those that come are, are agents, but these are the most serious buyers I've ever seen. But it's not that many of them, and that's actually a good thing because they're not dealing with all the, just the filtering. I said, you know, if you want to sell golf clubs, if you talk about targeting, if you want to sell golf clubs, you can buy an ad the Super Bowl and see millions of people would see it, but you're probably going to get more bang for your buck by buying a lot of ads on the golf channel. So we're applying that on scale across the country because the buyers of many properties, in, in one type of property, primary residential, they're going to be probably around in the area, upsize, downsize, but discretionary housing also comes from somewhere else in the country and we're already doing those kinds of a version of that target. So that's unfortunately all the time that we have. So thank you once again for having us.